Welcome to the HCRP studio. I'm Vlad Davidjak. I work for the Harris County GOP as a director of communications. I'm joined in the studio today by Philip Aronoff, who is a candidate seeking the Republican nomination for Congressional District 29 in the GOP primary. Primary will be held on March 6th. Early voting is ongoing now and ends this Friday. Philip Aronoff, welcome to the HCRP studio. Well, thank you. Thank you to you, Vlad. And thanks to Paul Simpson for having you here with the party and for doing this because Paul is doing a great job. And, uh, Proud to have been his friend for 30 years. So fantastic. Yeah. Now, um, Philip, you you are one of four candidates who is running for the GOP nomination in this particular race. Um, you've had a few different forums and debates and, and conversations with your fellow candidates. So, right now, uh, what one thing I'd like to know off the bat: what's your feeling of the race at this point? How do how how is the race looking to you? There's no real input available unless you do polling, and that's a lot of money to do polling. I'd rather send it, use the money for outreach, mail outs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not doing any TV or radio either. So I don't have a good feel for it, other than when I talk to people and I give a presentation the, this afternoon before I came here, I spoke to a Rotary Club. So many people came up to me after my speech and said, we agree with you exactly what you said, you have our support. But it's hard to get those kinds of opportunities. Sure. Uh, but but as far as the feel for the campaign, I feel good about it. I've yeah. done. I, I set out a game plan. I've done everything I, I plan to do. Raise the amount of money that I plan to raise. So I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I, I feel very good about next Tuesday. Good. Um, in terms of what you've been doing, this is this is a district that you're very familiar with. You, um, I, I heard you give a talk where you, you've actually done business in that district and had uh, business relationships in that district and, and even worked in that district for over 30 years. Right, so, right. My, my first year was out of college. I was in the a family scrap steel business inside the Port of Houston. We used to cut up railroad cars and other forms of scrap steel and load them on, load on, them on ships. Uh, to love send uh, mostly to Mexico, but we, we uh, had the business there in the yeah. uh, in the twenty ninth district, <laughs> right on Clinton Drive. Directly employing people oh, who we, live we, in we that had, immediate we had area. Two hundred people were working okay. for us at one time, and uh, everybody came from well, that area, sure, yeah. because it was easy for them to get to work in, and it was a blue collar area then as it is now. So you have a real sharp sense of the district itself, what composes it, what's it made of. Um, so how has it changed over these last 30, 40 years? Well, it, it's become a less blue-collar refinery worker, and it's become more Hispanic because as the Hispanics have moved here and, and joined this, the communities, uh, they've gravitated out there because people go to where there's other people uh, who share their history, sure. uh, share their language. And they have a lot of infrastructure support. I mean, if you go into a grocery store there, you're going to see products from Mexico or right. products from, from Guatemala, uh, more so than you're going to see on the on the west side of town. Okay. Um, you have been um, campaigning now uh, since you filed to run. Um, and obviously we're entering the final stretch of that race. This is the last week of early voting. The primary election itself is going to be on Tuesday. Um, what, uh, what do you anticipate? What, what, what do you hope to, uh, what do you hope to see on the election night? Are you hoping to, uh, get to a runoff in first position, second position? Uh, does the, does your interaction with voters help you illustrate that in any way? Do you have any real clear idea of what you'd like I, to be? I, I, well, I'd like to win without a runoff okay. because I, I mean, I, I, I filed for this because talking to Paul Simpson before the election, I said, is anybody going to run in the 29th? And he said, I haven't heard of anybody planning to run in the 29th. And I said, well, the front runner is Sylvia. She's the one that the uh, so-called so power brokers have anointed yeah. to, uh, to, to be their nominee. And we can't give her a free ride. Plus, more importantly to me, we're going to lose the Hispanic vote if we don't reach out to them. Now, I happen to be fluent in Spanish, but in addition to that, I understand who the Hispanic people are because yeah. I've spent so many years working with Mexico and with the Hispanic community here in Houston. And for 30 years, we have been saying amongst ourselves in the Republican Party that when the Hispanics 
become citizens, they'll become Republicans. And the reason we felt that is is because they share our values, the values of strong family, waiting till you get married to have children, a love of God, love of your church. And, and to be honest with you, the Hispanic community doesn't want to let men walk into the bathroom with their daughters. And, and yet the Democrat power pro brokers pass that in a law here in the state of in the city of Houston and many people from from the conservative movement took them on led by Paul Simpson as led, I recall. By, led by Paul Simpson took them on and, and forced a referendum and in this congressional district that referendum to repeal the the so-called bathroom bill the vote was 60 percent in favor of repeal so right. that tells me these people view the world the same way we do, these voters do, yeah. and they just don't get our message. Somebody else asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, I'm tired of being called a, a, a homophobe, a xenophobe, a, a contemptible. And they said, well, who called you that? I said, Hillary Clinton. She stood yeah. up there with her hands like this. Yeah. You know, called all of us deplorables. Yeah, they're all the deplorable. The basket of deplorables, yeah. And, and, and we're not. No. We're not. We care more about the people than they do. They want to divide us into groups and subgroups, <clears> separate <throat> us and divide us. To me, the most ironic thing is when the Democrats talk about the divisions in the country. Yeah, they're the ones who created them. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and we have tried to work with them, and they're not interested in working yeah. with us because they think they can have more electoral success by uh, by going against us. Yeah. How do you um, how do you how do you respond? to people who say, well, you know, the 29th district is uh, a heavy de Democrat district. Uh, it's been Democrat since Gene Green was there. Uh, it's probably going to go Democrat now. Sylvia Garcia is a foregone conclusion. What's, what's, what's your argument for your candidacy? Well, it's the, the, the first level is they're probably right, that, that, that it is, has historically been a Democratic district. I, I saw Gene Green a couple weeks ago. <coughs> And he said to me, why are you doing this? This district went 77% for Hillary Clinton. And my answer was, I like a challenge. But more importantly, if I'm not successful, yeah. I'm breaking ground for the next Hispanic who can uh, equally articulate the issues, who understands conservatism, mm -hmm. and he'll have a chance at it because they never, ever hear our ideas. And I am going to continue to get our ideas and our worldview out to these yeah, people. They're, they're very insulated by their Democrat um, overseers from Republican but, but areas, from conservatives. And... We're, we're responsible also. We have yeah. not reached out to them. We have not done that. Now, I have three opponents. None of them have ever done anything of substance in the party before. Only one has been to a convention, a Republican convention. The other two never, I don't even know if they vote in Republican primaries. But we have not made the effort. We've sort of just walked away from the Hispanic vote, and we can't do that any longer. We did it in California in 1994 when George Bush ran for governor the first time. I was his Harris County co-chairman. And he and I spent a lot of time talking about how do we reach out to the Hispanics. And we worked on it, and he got half the Hispanic vote in his first campaign for governor. Well, subsequent to that, uh, Pete Wilson that same year ran for governor of California, and he won also. And that was the end of the Republican Party in California. I remember that well. I remember reading about that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we're talking with Philip Aronoff. He's a candidate for uh, District 29 for Congress. You can... Um, Find his website, uh, AronoffForCongress.com. You can also find him on Facebook. He's Philip Aronoff for Congress. <clears throat> Philip, talk to us a little bit about your history. Um, what what uh, what led you to where you are now? You, I know you serve as the honorary consul of Hungary. Yes. And you have an extensive history. You actually mentioned just now that for uh, Governor Bush, you served as one of his uh, um, uh, one of the leaders of his, yeah. his efforts in his campaign. Well, uh, talk to us a little bit about the history that led you to this point. Well, Texas never had a Republican governor from the Civil War up until Bill Clements won in 1978. And in 1980, Bill Clements appointed one of my boyhood friends to be a judge. And in Texas, the judge has to run a campaign. 
So my friend called me up and said, I have to run a campaign and you have to run it for me. I said, I don't know anything about politics. So he said, learn and learn quickly. So I did. <laughs> and in running his Just campaign, threw you right in. Yeah, okay. In running his campaign, I met all the leadership of the Harris County Republican Party. Uh -huh. But they could all fit into a small room, into your conference room. There were very few of us back yeah. then. And, and so I got involved, and, and, and all these people, then two years later, 1982, uh, we had another series of elections. And a lot of the people I had dealt with the previous you know, two years before called me and said, help me on this campaign, help me on that campaign. And all of a sudden, I became very active. And then uh, Governor Clements lost in 82. Uh, and uh, so I didn't do much. But then in 86, he ran again, and I was vice chairman for Harris County for his campaign. Mm. And he won again. He, he beat uh, Mark White, who had defeated him four years earlier. And he appointed me. I was the chairman of the State General Services Commission, uh, where I bought a building in Austin and named it after Governor Clements. Uh, because we at that time, that commission had the naming rights. It so incensed the Democrats, they took the naming rights away from the uh, government agency and moved it into the legislature. Wow. But so I, I've just been very active. I, I've served on many campaign committees from Kay Hutchison to Phil Graham to Tom DeLay, Ted Poe. I mean, I'm close to every one of our congressmen uh, that, that surround us, Mike McCall and our dear friends. So uh, I've enjoyed working with them, and I've enjoyed fighting to uh, promote an ideology with them. So you have an extensive history of Republican involvement. You have deep roots in the conservative movement. Uh, you have extensive experience as a, as a grassroots activist in, in terms of uh, winning cam uh, campaigns and, and managing those operations. So what took all those different factors and pushed you over that line to become a candidate yourself? Fear. Fear. Fear of losing Texas. If we lose the Hispanic vote completely, we're going to lose Texas. If we lose Texas, we lose the United States. I have two beautiful grandchildren living here in Texas, and I don't want them to live in a California. There's no middle class left in California. The schools are crumbling in California. They want to go build a $60 billion high-speed train that no one's going to use and the taxpayers are going to have to pay for. I don't want that to happen to Texas. And that's where the left wants to take us. Right. And and I am afraid of that. And, and at this point in my life, I say, what can I do to stop them? And I want to be a voice for the conservative agenda into the Hispanic community because if they hear <coughs> the story, they'll, they'll, they'll come around. And that's my that's my goal. So, what's the appeal of Philip Aronoff versus the other three candidates who are running? What what distinguishes you in the minds of the the, the voters you're trying to target? What what is the the, the deciding factor for them in terms of ha having to make their choice? Because after 40 years of being active in politics, I have a network, not only throughout the state, I have a strong network, but I have people up in Washington D.C. I can call on yeah. to help. Uh, it's going to take a lot of money. Uh, to, to win this thing, and I have the ability to, to reach out to these people uh, that, that can help fund the campaign. Yeah. And, and beyond that, I have been part of the conservative movement from, from the Jack Kemp days uh, and, and am able to go with those people and help promote the conservative ideology. And that's what it's all about. This is an ideological, <laughs> values-based campaign. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I'm trying to do is... is spread a message. I want to win, but that's my second priority. My top priority is getting the message out so that these people will stop and think and say, you know, I really am a Republican. Suzanne Martinez, the, the governor of uh, New Mexico, New Mexico yeah. she tells the story. She gave it in her speech at the Republican National Convention. My husband and I had dinner with these conservative friends, and we walked out and got in the car, and we looked at each other and said, you know what? Yeah, I'll be damned. We're Republicans. Yeah. We don't belong as Democrats. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to be the, the catalyst that will make more people realize they really don't belong in the party of big government. That's what they fled, or their ancestors fled when they fled the Latin American corrupt governments. Yeah. That's what they fled. Democrats are no no less corrupt 
than, than Hugo <laughs> Chavez when he started to destroy Venezuela. And it's important to remember that the people who fled those Latin American countries, they're not just uh, poor people who have no resources. These are people who are highly educated, people who have advanced degrees. They have equally, alongside the people who are in the streets and starving and poor, fled across the border into America seeking a better opportunity. I, I certainly agree with that, but I'm also I, I'm more concerned with, with the, the people who don't have the resources that sure. these people have. Uh, I mean, one of the things that really impacted me the most was when 18 young Hispanic people yeah. died in that the van. That was a tragedy. But, but I'm angry at their government for forcing them to have to sneak across the border, but I'm disappointed in our government that, that they couldn't get here any other way but to be smuggled in. Yeah. Uh, somebody criticized me on my Facebook page for talking about the people who want to come here to work in, 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 in the restaurants, bussing tables, to mow your lawn. Those are the people who don't have anybody talking for them. Yeah. I want to be a voice for these people. I want them to be able to come here, not get welfare, get a visa to work here so they can come and go back and forth. And, and as long as there are jobs available, let them come and fill those jobs. And, and the welfare system is what people always use as a reason not to let them come. Don't punish them because we have such a distorted welfare system. Sure. Let me ask you this, Philip, um, because with with your extensive knowledge of, of the um, of the district itself and your history being part of it, why have the Democrats abandoned the people of CD twenty nine? Why have why have the Democrats not done anything for the residents of Congressional District twenty nine over these? I mean, Gene Green's been in Congress for almost thirty years. Um, he has nothing to show for it. What, why did they, they take them for granted? And so far, justifiably so. I want to give them another alternative. I, I mean, how can they take them so for granted? Because they continue to vote for them. 77% hmm. of the people voted for Hillary. That would have been a continuation of Obamacare. I mean, these people can't afford Obamacare. They can't even afford to pay it. But even if they get the subsidies, they can't afford the deductibles. So that wipes them out even worse, the deductibles. Yeah. So... Why would they support somebody who's going to continue forcing the the distortions into the health care system on these people? Yeah. The um, the, con the congressional district has always, uh, since it was formed, has always been intended to be a Hispanic district uh, for a Hispanic congressman. But the, the only congressman who's ever served there was Gene Green, who's... Not Hispanic at all. You're not exactly Hispanic either. Now, you do I, speak I Spanish. I can identify. If, if, if this is true. If the Democrats say I can identify as a girl, I can identify as a Hispanic. There you they go. They can't criticize me for that. <laughs> so so how, do you, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you engage with the Hispanic community? What, well, I, I engage well because I, I, I know them. I have many, many friends in the Hispanic community. Uh, so, so the engagement's not, not the issue at all. It's what is the message sure. that, that I have to give to them, and it's a message of hope, whereas the, the Democrats' message is a message of hating the, <laughs> hating the other side. That, that's, that's such a big difference. So. Yeah. We're speaking again with uh, Philip Aronoff. He's a congressional district candidate for CD29, seeking the Republican nomination in the 2018 GOP primary. You can find his website at aronoffforcongress.com. You can also find him on Facebook. He's at Philip Aronoff for Congress. Philip, one thing that I noticed the other night, we were at this um, CD29 debate that was being hosted at a church. And um, uh, interestingly, the debate was being moderated by Tom DeLay, who, who has an extensive uh, history with with congressional relations with the Harris County area in Houston, um, and one of the things that he he talked about was the uh, separation that members of Congress have deliberately taken away from the Constitution, and it's caused a lot of the problems that have arisen in the last few years with regard to overreach of government and. Uh, congressional members not being responsive at all to their constituents. Um, what was your takeaway from, from that well, conversation? I, obviously, I agreed. I mean, the, 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 to me, the most blatant example of that was the whole DACA thing. For, for years, Obama said, I can't do it. I don't have the authority, but Congress has to do it. 
And then he decided it would be more politically opportunistic to go ahead and do it. And he did it. Yeah. I mean, you can't do that. It, it, this is a nation of laws. If, if the president can start doing things like that, then he can do anything. Then there's no stopping him. And then we're back. Then we're going to end up like 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 uh, the Central American countries with, with their with their strong caudillo leaders. So we have to stop that. And and that was the exciting thing for me about Donald Trump, that he, he, you know the Democrats saying we have to protect these eight hundred thousand DACA people. Yeah. And Trump said, No, we're going to pass a law and we're going to protect all two million of these kids, the ones who didn't come out and sign sign up for DACA. We're going to protect them too. I said, wow, that is really exciting, and that's wonderful, because I support letting these people come here and be part of our society, because they've been part of this society their whole life, mm-hmm. and, they, and they contribute, and they can be such productive members uh, of our society. Yeah. You have, um, you've been extremely busy during this campaign. There's a lot of events ongoing, lots of different things that are taking place on a daily basis. Are there any particular events coming up that you'd like to the viewers to uh, maybe come meet you at? Or No, I, mean, I, I had my meet and greet, and uh, so I'm not doing another one until till after the, uh, the primary night. Mm-hmm. But as of now, I have no event scheduled for, that I'm sponsoring. Okay. I mean, I, I will what about attending any events? Are you going to be going to any kind of... Uh, uh, you, I want to know you went to the meet with the Rotary Club this morning. Yeah, I spoke with the Rotary okay. Club. Do you have any other speaking engagements coming uh, up? No, I don't. Okay. I mean, it's hard to find opportunities to speak to a well, crowd. Especially in like CD29. This. It's a yeah, little bit complex. You, you know, I mean, I've spoken at churches on Sunday mornings, uh, not, giving the, not giving the sermon, but certainly giving the appeal to, to the values that these people share. Otherwise, sure. they wouldn't be in church. Uh, but... Uh, Non, sort of non-political <laughs> speeches, not not attacking anybody, but just explaining, trying to teach who is the Republican Party, sure. what do we stand for, what are our values, because our values are your values. What what does the Republican Party need to do between now and November, to help turn CD twenty nine and flip it red? Show them where we will end up if the Democrats control the country. Uh, first off, the Democrats take over Congress. Nothing's going to happen positive. They're going to spend the next two years trying to impeach Trump. But I, I'm very optimistic that, that the people understand it. The Democrats, you net, without any Republican support, passed the egregious Obamacare, right. which just totally distorted the, the medical delivery system. I already mentioned how it hurt everybody with, with, with the co-pays and, 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 uh, and the deductibles. And so that's when they act all by themselves, what happens. On the other side, the Republicans, without a single Democratic vote, vote passed the tax reform bill. Right. The economy has just started to boom and explode yeah, since then. Yeah, it's been exploding and, and, and the Democrats are saying, this is Armageddon. This is the end of the earth. Letting people keep their money is the end of the earth? Is the Armageddon? Come on, Nancy Pelosi. What are you talking about? She right. has no understanding of economics. Yet, if, if, if whoever wins, if the Democrat wins the primary, they're going to vote for Nancy Pelosi for Speaker, and I'm going to vote for Paul Ryan. Yeah. What a difference. That's what a, a difference. difference. So the, the, the future of Congressional District 29 is at stake. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the uh, GOP primary uh, early voting ends this Friday, March 2nd. And uh, the primary election itself is this Tuesday, March 6th. Uh, Again, we've been speaking with Philip Aronoff. He's a candidate running for uh, CD29 for the GOP nomination uh, to replace the outgoing Democrat. You can find his website at AronoffForCongress.com. And you can find him on Facebook, Philip Aronoff for Congress. Phil, thank you very much for joining us here in the HCRP studio. I really appreciate you taking the time to come by and see us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I feel so lucky that our party has you here to to handle our communications. Whatever they pay, it's not enough. I agree. Thanks. See you next time. (laughs)